Um, what I want to do is get right into trust law. Most of us um, who have had any contact whatsoever with the judicial branch of our government, uh, police officers or traffic court or um, divorce court especially, I would think, um, have discovered that things are not fair, that uh, life tends to be much more difficult whenever you're involved in the uh, judicial branch. And your assertion is that it's because we don't understand the law and that um, we would all be much better off if we understood trust law. Is that correct? That's in a nutshell, yes. Well, I, won't, I should have done this first. Um, we have, or uh, you have created a document which I have put on my website. Um, if you're interested in following along, getting a printout of this, you can go to constitutionpreservation.org slash trust law primer. And then those are underscores instead of spaces. So it's trust underscore law underscore primer, P R I M E R dot PDF. So it's constitutionpreservation.org slash trust underscore law underscore primer dot PDF. And it's a six page document that was generated uh, uh, by Mr. Taylor to help you understand. Uh, a little bit about trust law, and that's the document that we're going to be uh, using as our uh, text today. So give, give me an example of a trust. What, what are the three things necessary to, uh, three elements of a trust? To know that we've got a trust, we've got to have a beneficiary. There's a fancy name for it, Sesco K Trust. It's uh, an ancient term, but we have to have a beneficiary. We also have to have someone responsible for the trust. We have to have a fiduciary or a trustee. It's the same term, same concept, different terms. And we have to have a trust property. There has to be a trust property. Of these three elements, we can it's another item in there. We can go back over this again. Of these three elements, we have absolutely to have two of them. There must be a beneficiary and there must be a trust property. If there is no beneficiary, there is no trust. If there is no trust property, there is no trust. So what do we do with the fiduciary? If there is a want for a fiduciary, the trust still exists and a court of competent jurisdiction may supply a fiduciary. So we have to have a beneficiary. We have to have a trust property. Uh, the trust will function with the fiduciary. And if for some reason the fiduciary uh, leaves office, uh, can't fulfill the duties, whatever, then a court of competent jurisdiction may supply one. So it won't fail for one of a fiduciary. It will fail for one of a beneficiary or want of trust property. So let's let's go. I want to uh, generate an, an example. Let's assume for the moment that I am very rich and that I have children. Unfortunately, neither is true. And I want to leave $20 million dollars to my children who are currently about 10 years old and um, the doctor tells me that I'm not in good health and that probably have uh, you know less than a year to live okay why well, not have a problem if I want to leave 20 million dollars to my uh, children you know I give the the money to a 10 year old uh, the 10 year old's going to spend it on you know pokemon toys etc and we're not going to have uh, you know the child is going to lose the money or be swindled out of it so what I need to do is to um, uh, set up a, a trust, a, uh, a contract, which allows, allows me to um, contract with Uncle Chuck. Uncle Chuck will uh, hold the money until the children are, uh, you know, 21 or whatever the, the contract decides. And then the um, uh, Uncle Chuck will then give the, the $20 million to to the children. Now, the children would be the beneficiaries. Um, I am the creator of the trust, 
and Uncle Chuck is the trustee. And the reason that I pick Uncle Chuck as the trustee is specifically because I trust him. So that would be the, the three elements of the trust. Is that right? Correct. And uh, we've got, uh, well, you've added actually a fourth one, and that's fine. The grantor or the creator isn't really an element of the trust. Uh, we have that as a byproduct, especially oh. when the creator is not necessarily also the trustee. But, yeah, well, you've, you've identified them all. We just didn't also say, and, by uh, the way, $20 uh, million dollars is uh, $20 million. property. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, but yeah you, a... you, you covered it, and it's an excellent example. And, of course, what you're talking about here is just very run-of-the-mill, very standard estate planning. There are lawyers that spend their careers helping people deal with that exact scenario. Uh, it's a very common topic, what you're talking about there. And there are a lot of people who have had interaction with trust law on these very issues. Uh, it's a very common part of estate planning. All we're doing here, all that we're doing here is saying, great, once we have this model in mind, once we have this picture of how this area of the law works, let's don't look at it solely in terms of estate planning. Let's see how this can be used offensively by those that have evil motives. Offensively. Offensively. So we, are, we are being attacked by this type of uh, of law. When we f when we understand what has happened, we will very naturally and very understandably feel attacked by it. And that's what they're doing. They're using this area of the law and seducing us into making agreements that we don't even know are agreements or what the extent of those agreements are, and then hammering us when we breach those deals. So as we understand the law of trust outside the context of estate planning, then we start to realize exactly what the problem is. And so directly in line with the theme for where your audience is directing the concept and the energy, the solution in this area really is in the correct identification of the problem. So, as well, we... In, in your uh, primer, the very first paragraph, you said that the uh, there's this legal mechanism for the traffic code and correct. municipal court systems. Um, we only have about two minutes. Can you give us a brief overview of how that applies to trust law? I sure can. In two minutes, let's cover the basis for traffic codes everywhere. The automobile itself is owned in trust. How did that happen? The typical owner of a new car never sees the document that is evidence of full title. That document is called the manufacturer's statement of origin or the manufacturer's certificate of origin, and we don't ever see that. That paperwork is handled behind the scenes, and it's that document that is, for us in Texas, uh, it's sent to Austin, and DPS turns around and gives us this thing called a certificate of title, or the state turns around and gives us this thing called the certificate of title. What's that? It's legal title. So what do we have when we have a document that is evidence of legal title only? It's evidence of split interest in the property. What a trust does is divide the legal interest, which Uncle Chuck would have, from the equitable interest, which the kids would have. So Uncle Chuck can trade the property and trade legal title. And the kids or their representatives, depending upon what their age is, have control over the equitable interest. This is how traffic courts started. Traffic court is nothing but a maritime system, which means there must be an agreement at the base. There must be an agreement. So we look and look and look and look. Where in the world could that agreement be? And we find that what they do with the ownership of the car in the beginning is set up a trust. 
not in a common law court. This is the part this is the part that many people are stunned and surprised at the uh, the idea that a there is more than one type of law and that when we go into a court of law that our um, our constitutional rights are not being protected there when we when we talk to the judge about the constitution the judge will frequently tell us do not talk to me about the constitution in my court and could you can you highlight that difference for us a little bit sure when one goes into that forum the first or one of the first things we want to check out is the law of the flag being demonstrated in that forum. If there's a gold fringe on the flag, they're in maritime jurisdiction, and not just for that particular case, for all of them. So, as we come to understand that there really is a difference in the forum, in other words, law of the land has no gold fringe on the flag, versus the maritime system, where all the flags the so-called state flags and the so-called national flag have gold fringe on them, then we're in a maritime forum. That, at the beginning, tends to freak some people out, and they just stop right there and say that's wrong and that's illegal and that's unconstitutional and you can't do that. We need to go beyond that and say, okay, if you're in a maritime forum, where's the agreement? Oh, the, their system is a house of cards, Staring down a Texas tornado right after we understand what the rules of the game are. Well, let's go to the rules of the game. Let, let's assume that we are not under constitutional law. Let's not look at the Constitution. Let's look at admiralty jurisdiction. What are the rules of the game in admiralty jurisdiction, and how can we... Uh... In general... If we're in Admiralty, if we're in Maritime, then we are in a commercial forum. There will be two fundamental bases for activity in a judicial forum, uh, a Maritime forum. There will be two. One will be a private obligation of some kind or other. It will be contract-based or trust-based. Or the other is a tort action. A tort action would be like slipping on the grapes at the grocery store. The liability for the grocery store arises due to the negligence of not managing that stand of grapes. So they breached the duty of due care, and the lady fell, and so an action arises. That's the tort duty. That's not going to happen very often in what we're talking about. You can see that that just simply doesn't register. It's just not common sense for that to be the basis for, say, a property tax claim or an employment tax claim or an income tax claim or a traffic court matter. There has to be a different mechanism. Of course, that different mechanism is a private obligation. Federal means federal. Federal does not mean national federal absolutely positively does not mean constitutional federal means federal at a level of a state where we ordinarily think of a, a body politic as a state federal means by compact or by treaty at the level of the individual where all of us are federal means by private obligation once we understand that, and we understand that the forum in which these obligations are evaluated, and in fact the choice of law in which they are entered into, not to our surprise, we, we do this unknowingly. The choice of law there is the maritime law, not the law of land. Well, let's go back and give some concrete examples again. We're talking about... Um this traffic court thing, it all starts when we buy the car. And right. tell, us, tell us a little bit about the, the title. What is the actual title for the car, and what do they send us after I've made my five years' worth of payments? Okay. Uh, what they send us after five years of payment is exactly what we get the minute the agreement is opened. It's a legal title only. 
that evidence, the evidence of legal title only, is what everyone has in their file drawer. It's called a certificate of title. It looks like real fancy paper, and it's got embossing in it, and all this fancy artwork on it. It's legal title only. What we traded in order to get legal title only is the document that is full title. The document that is full title comes out of, well, I'd say Detroit, just to, to name a place. But it comes with the manufactured car. The title paperwork, the full title paperwork, moves with the car in transit all the way to the dealership. Now, that document is called the Manufacturer's Statement of Origin. And that's full title, and we never see those, and the only time we ever really see one is when we get a microfiche printout, and then we don't see the back side. What happens with those documents? I'm not 100% sure. I've never seen the process, but I'm 98% sure this is what happens. We trade the MSO that we never see when we go in and buy the car. We trade the MSO that we never see for the certificate of title. The MSO goes to Austin, it gets microfished or microfilmed and promptly shredded. So the title information that is on the reverse side of that MSO is the title information. And what we need to know is that that's the problem. What's the solution? Negotiate for the MSO. Good morning, Jakob. Uh, good morning. Do you have a question for Mr. Taylor? Well, actually, I was uh, listening to your conversation or after, uh, for several days. I've listened to you folks, uh, you and Harmon speak, and I've learned much by listening uh, to you and, and, and very impressed with your show. I'm a new, well, thank uh, you. new listener. Okay, uh, well, thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, what it seems to me first, based on your conversation with Harmon there, what it seems to me first, I must accept the concept of law of man over man. Therefore, since I do not, all law is fraudulent when the basis of the law is founded upon deceit. And it seems to me when I'm listening here that we're talking about how a title given by a state is done deceptively without knowledge that's deceit, without the person being involved in that split uh, interest. Uh, that is a deceit. And if that law is based on deceit, in my mind, that law should not even exist. And I believe the Supreme Court and the Constitution would even validate that point. But basically what I'm getting to is this. I think that the laws of men are too important to men. And they should more concern themselves with the laws of Yodhe and make sure that they are following his law first and foremost. And to me, I think the Constitution protects me on the basis that I have the right to that philosophy, being that there's only one law we need to be concerned with. And all these laws of men, I think the best thing for man is if all of them, all of those parchments were burned well, in a gigantic fire. I, I, I agree with you uh, in, I in, in general. Uh, one thing that I would like to correct is that the Constitution does not protect you. It's our job to protect the Constitution. It yeah, is, after I, I, all, over yeah. yeah, I agree. Yes, okay. totally, totally, but, totally and, agree. And I have, I have exactly, exactly the same problem that you have. I mean, it's like, wait a minute, this is a fraud. I mean, just, and and I've been going through some uh, some learning process myself, and my reaction is, you know, more from a scientific point of view, just because they said so, doesn't make it true. If they say that I'm a purple rabbit, that doesn't make me a purple rabbit. Right. And, and the person who was teaching me said, yes, that's absolutely true. However, keep in mind that if they think that you're a purple rabbit and they think that, you know, it is purple rabbit hunting season, you're still going to be in a little bit of trouble. And, and so I, and I, I agree with you that, mm -hmm. you know, the laws of men are, you know, far too important to men and that this is all a fraud. Mm -hmm. But... What I've, I've tried to come to grips with recently is the fact that, well, it, it is a fraud, and until we can get back to common law, until we can get back to um, the, the Constitution and, uh, you know, honor and liberty in the United States, we're going to have to know what the rules of the game are to try to defeat this game so we can get back to it. 
I, 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 I consider, I I consider this kind of a temporary, uh, a temporary solution where we need to know this kind of fraud so that we can defeat it. Uh, uh, definitely, yeah. definitely. And I think one of the keys to that, I believe, is understanding and seeing the sovereignty of the individual first and foremost. When we see the sovereignty in ourselves, and then we can see the sovereignty in our brother or sister, whatever the case may be, and recognizing that we are all sovereign, and that in that philosophy, in that concept, whenever a man tries to push his rule of the day upon us, we must stand up and say, no, I'm a sovereign individual, I'm not your subject, I'm not your slave, and I'm not going to submit to that. I, I agree. Applause, applause. <laughs> I Thank could you. not have said it better myself. Thank you. Do you, do you have an actual question for Mr. Taylor? You know, you know what? Uh, just listen to you folks who answer my questions, and I just wanted to make that point that uh, uh, when the laws of men are, uh, are created by men, the basis are usually found upon some type of fraud somewhere or another. And, and basically the fraud is they don't even have the uh, the authority to create laws to rule another man. I, I just wanted to make I that agree. point. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, what we're, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get back to uh, rule of law, you know, and uh, restore this constitutional republic. Yeah, Thank you, Yeah, let's restore all men to the authority of the Father. I, Hallelujah. I agree. You bet. <laughs> Thank have you for great, your call. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Well, Harmon, you're doing an excellent job. See how brightly you're lighting these fires of liberty? Well, we need to, to address some more of that. I was going to wait for that one to conclude, and we're coming up on a break, so I don't know how much time we've got to address it right now. But his uh, call is the kind of call that's the most important, because if we cannot get beyond the barrier at which he is stopping, we will not solve the problem. I, I, I agree. And, and it's a barrier that I've had. Yeah, sure. He's it, in it, wonderful, it, wonderful company. A wonderful yeah. company. The I, whole I, nation has been there. Well, let's focus on that barrier. Let's focus on that barrier and help our uh, listeners to step over it. The, the framework, the choice of law at which the caller evaluates the matter is the law of the land choice of law. If we were there, he would have a 100% dead bang defense to all of this stuff. We are not there. That is not the choice of law. And under the choice of law in which we find ourselves with all of these agreements that we don't know about, that morally seem to us to be deceitful, is not the law of the land. It's the constitution-free maritime commercial zone. So the entire system is designed around deceit, but we need to remember the story of the Gibeonites who deceived Joshua and the princes of Israel, and the Lord upheld that treaty that they entered into against Israel. It didn't matter how much the fraud was by the Gibeonites. That didn't matter. When Saul went in and butchered them, the Lord put a judgment on Israel, and it was a famine. And about three years into the famine, David said to God, what's up with this famine? And God told him, do you remember Saul and do you remember the Gibeonites? So long story short, David arrested seven of Saul's descendants, turned them over to the Gibeonites, and the Gibeonites hanged them, hanged them at the same time. That ended the judgment. And the lesson there is the agreement made in the Lord's name will be enforced. It doesn't matter how fraudulently induced it is. The Lord told us, don't do deals with the Canaanites. He told us, and he told us, and he told us. Okay, here we are doing deals with the Canaanites. Now, Canaanite here is not a national reference. It's a spiritual reference. The people who intend to deceive us, no matter their race, are Canaanites. We've been told to do no deals with the Canaanites. Well, guess what we did? Deal after deal after deal after deal after deal with the Canaanites. And when we do what this caller does, is call on the name of the Lord then what are we saying? We're saying our yes means yes and our no means no. It's exactly what we're saying. So we do these deals, we pick the choice of law, we go into them, and then we decide, nope, not going to do it after all. Okay, our yes isn't yes, our no isn't no. And it's literally the Lord God Almighty himself who is enforcing these deals against us through this system that is a beast system. So we can go into exactly what the caller is talking about and do nothing but heap coals upon our own head 
unless we understand what is the reality that we're dealing with. We don't have to deal with the reality. We can stand back from it and say it's all fraud, it's all fraud. We can do that, but nothing will change. We've stood back from it and said it's all fraud, it's all fraud for 50 years. As a community, primarily in the income tax area, but as a community, that's exactly been our approach and what has happened. Nothing constructive. The problem has simply gotten worse. Once we get beyond that barrier and we say, okay, fine, what is the choice of law and what are these deals we're into? Now we're across that barrier. And now we're saying, fine, if I'm in an agreement here, why don't you show me what I signed? You say there's an agreement. I see the gold friends on your flag and there's no tort action going on here. So, okay, if that's what your case is, if that's the theory of your case, then you will be kind enough, I'm sure, just to show me what it is I've signed. They'll either produce it or they won't. If they can't produce the agreement in the maritime forum, guess what? They don't have a case. <laughs> so we don't necessarily agree with the rules, but once we learn the rules, we can learn the rules and win. Amen. That's exactly right. Um, Harmon, this is wonderful. I really appreciate your being on today. I think that we have uh, found the door. This is kind of like the Rosetta Stone to uh, solving all of our problems. And uh, it's uh, strange and unusual to many people. Um, you were talking about the, the two different Michaels, you know, one in uppercase and one in lowercase. Can Correct. you tell us more about that and the legal implications of them? The legal implications is what I call the federal capacity versus the proper capacity. It's, it's not where the popular mindset has taken that. It's not a separate entity. It's not a corporation. It's not a vessel. It has characteristics of all of that. All those preliminary evaluations are very close. It's, it just let's go the next step. It's not really a separate entity. It is us, just with a different relationship. What's the relationship? The all caps name identifies the well. Let's just call it the membership name. There's there's a membership, and I call it the Church of the United States. We can call it the federal government. We can call it what we want to. But there's a membership. It's a private club. And we have to apply to get in. Now, the policy is anyone who's a, who applies gets in. Anyone who applies gets in, but so that we know that you're a member, use your membership ID name. And your membership ID name is the all caps name. So when we are animating, when we're using the all caps name, we're saying I'm acting as a member of this club. And so all of the club rules apply to everything I do with this name. The proper spelling name is the membership to a different club. The, all the, the proper spelling name, the upper lowercase name, would be the club that people think they're in and just aren't. That would be the law of the land club. The all caps name is membership to the Constitution Free Maritime Commercial Zone Club. And that's, that's one of the simplest ways to describe it. Capacity describes a relationship. And it's the relationship with that other system that is identified by the all caps name. So we're, we don't see guys are born as a son. They may also be a brother. They may also be a nephew. They may be a cousin at birth. Later they may be a boyfriend, husband, uncle, all that. We are not in one or more of those relationships, flesh and blood, and then in the other relationships, a commercial entity or a vessel on the high seas, whether it's pavement or water. We're not somebody different just because the law gives us a different relationship. The law identifies all the relationships so it knows what to do in that relationship. Okay, that's all that the all caps name does. Now, it does have legal significance. Some say it doesn't have any legal significance, and of course it does, it has huge legal significance. It's if we're going to animate the federal government system club, then we operate in the all-caps name. 
and it's presumed. Uh, all of the mail that we get when our address is sold, the names will come in the all caps. It's just the system. It's just presumed. Right. So, so that's that's where that comes in. So this is not that terribly difficult to understand. It's basically a relationship. We can have someone named John Smith, who's the guy that you shook hands with, but we may introduce him at the cocktail party as Mary Smith's husband. There you go. And so, you know, he has a relationship with somebody, but that it's still the same person. John same person. Smith and Mary, Mary Smith's husband are the same person. Same guy. And, and so basically we have ended up getting married to this federal system that we don't know about. Is there some way to dissolve that relationship? Can we get a divorce from that federal <laughs> system? Uh, it's, it's a lot like cavalry. We've got to die to it. We just have to stop existing in that system uh, the and the mechanism for that is this a divorce would be a one-time process and we are so inundated with opportunities I put that term in quotes and say it very tongue-in-cheek we are inundated with opportunities to animate the federal capacity we're inundated with opportunities to use that all caps name so we have to to identify all of those opportunities and terminate all of them. It won't be a one-shot deal. It's not like we can go file something in the clerk's office and have it be done. It's a good intent, but the agreements will always take charge over just a unilateral statement. So, uh, Social Security, for example, that comes in the all caps. Those accounts cannot be closed. The solution there is to stop using it, and those who have tried to stop using that realize that they cannot be an employee. They really can't participate in the financial system. They sure can't do credit. And life basically shuts down for those who don't use that number. So the answer to your question is, yes, of course there is a way to do it. And the rest of the answer is, no, it's not as simple as simply a one-step process. We have to get rid of that entire way of thinking. We have to get rid of that entire way of living. And there are so many conveniences in our lives these days that are made possible by our animating that federal capacity, which connection is not accidental. They want to have an ownership feel about it, and it worked. That part they got right. But uh, so the answer is yes. It is not at all simple. Not at all simple. Uh, mechanically, if there is a family unit, then one spouse can fairly well go cold turkey. The other spouse is still there. And it will take uh, at least two generations and maybe three fully to work through that system if we do it in the normal course. If we do it in a way that we can survive the transition then, yeah, it's possible to do, but it won't happen today. Well, it is an interesting uh, challenge, and to me it sounds like a Joe versus the volcano situation. If you remember that movie, um, Tom Hanks is given all this money. All he has to do at the end is just throw himself into the volcano. Um, all these conveniences are nice, but at the sacrifice of my liberties, I don't think that's a good choice. Harmon, we have uh, someone in Texas. Um, we're going to talk to Alan. Good morning, Alan. Yeah, this is Alan. Yeah, do you have a question for Mr. Taylor? Yes, sir. Uh, my son was searched, and they found tobacco and drug paraphernalia, and on the ticket the cops said that it was a consensual search. And my son pleaded not guilty, but he's got to confront the officer in court I'm not allowed to do it because I'm not a lawyer, and it seems pretty uneven, you know, the intellect of a law enforcement officer against a juvenile. Well, that's, I, that's, I know that that's not fair, but the police officer chose to be a pol you know, police officer, so if he's going to be on the short end of the stick intellectually, that's his problem. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, the, the problem is uh, I just want to let this guy know he can't search my son every time the kid's just walking down the street. How, you know, how old is how old is your is this his son? He's sixteen now. Okay. And uh, uh, he, go ahead. Well, he's 
He's giving him the slip before when he's on his bicycle or riding a scooter. He's giving the cops the slip. And so, you know, they are out to get him. And the problem is he'll be 17 next year. He'll be going to the big boy jail. And I, I just feel like the cop lied because he put down that it's it was a consensual search and he never asked him permission to search. Harmon, do you have any any suggestions? Uh, several. Do you happen to have access to the... Uh, Texas Criminal Procedure Code. Oh, I can find it on the Internet, I guess. Okay, it will be there, and if you have a problem finding it, email me, uh, L-E-G-A-L underscore R-E-A-L-I-T-Y, legal reality, at earthlink.net, and I can help you find it. The concept that comes to mind, I was just looking for it really quickly and, and didn't get to it uh, rapidly, but to answer your question, for purposes of who gets to say what in the municipal court. I'm presuming you're in a standard municipal court, excuse me, not necessarily a municipal court of record, but either way, what you will find about Chapter 45 is a statement that talks about juveniles. I'm also going to guess, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you also have, or one of his parents, has been summoned to participate in the proceedings? Yes. Okay. What they have just done, on the one hand, is make you a party. If they turn right around, because you're not a witness, there's no other reason to summon you. You are a party, because it's ridiculous to say that you're a witness. You are not there. So, if they, on the one hand, summon you to be there, and on the other hand, prevent your participation... We get into a matter that is described by the Supreme Court in a case called Bodie v. Connecticut. It's called denial of access to the court. And so if you, if you are not allowed to participate in that, it's a, it's a long road to home. I'm just saying you can use one of the statutes in there that talks about the uh, nature of your having to be there and they put in the provision that you're summoned. So, in the in the code there. So, what am I saying? I'm saying you're a party. If they say you are a party by that summons and then turn right around and say you cannot participate in this, then in, in my view of things, that's grounds for appeal. It's the kind of thing they probably don't want to address, but they may not understand the problem well enough to know that they don't want to touch it. Well, the other thing is they said I could uh, give my son questions to ask, but my son himself had to ask the questions because I'm not okay. aware. Right, and see, that's the game they play with all the parents they summon in, and what I'm telling you is challenge them on that. Okay. You'll, you'll need to put something in writing in the court. You'll need to have some kind of motion or some kind of objection and document it so that that may move forward with the entire record on trial de novo to the county court. But preserve that error. Make real good and sure that the record has in writing an affidavit it would do that documents what happened in the trial court. The municipal courts are not real good about entering signed orders. So we have to preserve the facts of the matter as to what happened so that we can preserve the point later. And where that comes up, we we won't know. We don't know how far up the line we'll have to take it. But at the end of the day, if they summon you as a party and disallow your participation, that's bad. They think they can do it, but the only reason that they think they can do it is because no one has stood up to them to tell them that they're wrong. So just stick to your guns. No, no need to be terribly upset about it. It's a, it's a mill. It's a commercial mill. It's a revenue mill. Their entire point is revenue. So they will have their way with you. They will have their way with your son in their forum. The objective in the municipal court is to understand enough about it to preserve the points for trial de novo. And there are several points in all of that sort of thing. On the specific issue about the search, there's a lot of stuff to study. 
what is and what is not a consensual search. It doesn't matter how the cop describes it. It matters what the facts are that the judge up the line is going to review. So if there was a basis for the stop, then there may also be basis for the search. And there are just scads of cases, dozens of cases, that address that. And so right now, off the top of my head, I can't give you my opinion on whether that was a good search or not. But consent matters where there is no warrant. There's rules about warrantless searches. If one of their rules applies, as in exigent circumstances, we think we're going to lose evidence, then it doesn't matter whether it's a consensual search or not. The search is good. If there are not exigent circumstances, if they're in a circumstance where they can, in fact, get a warrant, and I understand some of the warrants can be done electronically these days, and it's something else to check, then maybe they don't have exigent circumstances, and maybe they did need a warrant, and now consent does matter, and now everything that happened matters. And whether your son gave consent or objected, and whether that can be established to a jurist's satisfaction or the satisfaction of the administrative advisory panel, we have no juries. We're not in a law of the land system. We have maritime administrative advisory panels, but... Just the same, they are our neighbors, and we can satisfy them. No, that was not a consensual search. They Alan, to what, was the, what was what was the re- original reason the police officer stopped to talk to your son? He saw him walking down the road with his friend, and he knows he's the kid's a pothead, and he he just decided to search him. He turned around and went and searched him. I see. And and walking, and just walking down, they're walking down the road. There's no curfew. They're just there. Right, at the end, yeah. Okay, well, unless there's something more to that, uh, I, I would hope you'd be able to prove up an adequate uh, basis for a motion to suppress. It will most likely be denied in the municipal court. They're not real keen on the, the latest in these kinds of rules. But anyway, well, yeah, just document it all. Harmon Taylor, my co-host, thank you for being here this morning, Harmon. And we have lit up a question in Illinois. Michael, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Yes, uh, I appreciate your show, Michael, and uh, I really appreciate Harmon. I've been following him for quite a few years and really wanted to talk to him. I have a question for him. Uh, Fire away. appreciate the call. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, I was listening to Alfred Adas' show, and he had a friend that he said was declared 100% disabled and can't get insurance. But he also said that he cannot be brought into court on a traffic citation or on anything like that. So I am speculating that he's not insurable. He can't be property. Like I, I know, Harmon, your position is that, you know, the, the all-caps name is a, you know, is a, Type of position. I forget, I forget the term. Capacity. Capacity. Right. Good. But you have I, been listening. I, Excellent. I, I'm thinking though that the capacity is as a res in the trust, as a property in the trust, as opposed to you know being a beneficiary of. What do you think? Uh, well, where where you're headed there is the next topic that we'll get into. What we just covered was basically an insurance right. contract, but truly is a contract scenario to illustrate the voluntary nature of the beneficiary. Where you're headed is close to something that I haven't spent a lot of time talking about. That is, what is the trust res for the trust that we're going to talk about here in a minute, I think. But, yeah, for example, we can look at one's labor. Let's just address part of it right now. Let's look at one's labor. Is that part of the trust property for a different trust? Not one that we've talked about before, but one we're going to talk about in a minute. Is that part of the trust property? It's very difficult to say no. Right. In fact, it's very difficult to say anything but, yes, that trust property must include the fiduciary's labor. Right. 
So it's a it's a great question that you ask, and it's a it's a wonderful segue into where we may be headed here in just a few minutes. But, but uh, yeah, I, my thinking though is that say in a in a uh, when, when a uh, a car is no longer declared, uh, so, you know, people are getting their salvage or their their car declared, uh, you know, I forget totaled. the term that they use. Yeah, totaled. Okay. It no longer has any commercial value, therefore it can no longer be insured, correct? Uh, As the property that was insured, yes. Mm -hmm. Once once all the insurance is cleaned on that transaction, whether Mm -hmm. it would be insured again as scrap metal or not might be the question, but insured as the item that's a functioning vehicle, Obviously, that would right. change, right? Yeah, yeah. and I, I think my thinking is that the state, in order to hold any part of that vehicle, it has to be have commercial value to it. If the state is a commercial entity, or you know, therefore it couldn't, just like the same way this friend of Alfred Adas couldn't be insured, he was declared 100% disabled. They couldn't hold his body as as their property because he can't be insured because he would have no commercial value. Is that does that does well, that think he's not okay? Or? <laughs> the the connection between municipal court and insurability is not a direct one. It sounds like the concept that has been discussed at, in that other scenario is the purported direct association between insurability and jurisdiction of a court. And there is no direct connection there in the scenario that you've identified. In other words, the the agreement behind the jurisdiction of the municipal court isn't the insurability of the party who's receiving the claim against them. Right. So that, in other words, to be very diplomatic about it, let's let's start back at the top of the mountain and identify what it is exactly that we're dealing with in the municipal court. And Michael and I did a discussion on that. I don't know a program or two of, of hours back. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, and, I'm, I uh, listened to it. Yeah. Okay, uh, that what what we went into there really briefly was the basis for the the agreement and the basis for the jurisdiction right in the municipal court and in in that is not the issue of insurance whether of the vehicle right. or of the driver of anybody yeah, it's the so registration it's, right so the insurance issue really has nothing to do with the jurisdiction of the municipal court in those traffic code based scenarios right. Right. Well, because uh, I've been in traffic court before, though, and I've had the judge tell me that he has in rem jurisdiction, okay. and and the vehicle was not did not have a plate on it, and the only you know and and everything I did, he just basically denied, and he answered a plea for me, and I'm thinking, well, this judge has is acting as my fiduciary over my, me what do you think <laughs> well again we can uh, maybe we should just spend a couple of minutes since the issues come up and it is in the area of trust the I want to address one presumption way early on people will say yeah a judge told me this and yeah a judge told me that and, yeah a judge told me something else I don't know how to be any more diplomatic than this than to say just because that's the source of it doesn't necessarily make it so. Right. Okay. Right. Now, going going from there, the the basis for the jurisdiction in the municipal court is the agreement that involves the car itself, and the car is owned in trust. And that trust is set up unknowingly to 99.9% of the people who have them. And it's set up 
by the transaction by which the manufacturer's statement of origin is sent to the office there in the state, and when the certificate of title is returned to the alleged owner. Now there's a trust set up. The trust res at least includes that car. The certificate of title holder is the legal title owner, and the party who possesses at least the microfilmed copy, I don't think the MSO lasts very long after it's microfilmed. I think they shred them. Right after that is is done, right after the MSO, the original paper is destroyed and it's microfilmed, then we still have possession of at least that best evidence, which is the true and correct copy of that document. And the entity or the body that holds that best evidence is quite, quite likely the beneficiary. Now, there may be more than one beneficiary, but we have in the handling of the title of that car the creation of the trust, and it is from that agreement then that we get the rest of what we deal with in traffic court. Mm -hmm. if, if we try to mix anything else into that, all we're going to do is confuse ourselves and confuse the issue. These things aren't really complicated. There's a lot of ideas floating around out there. There's a lot of people trying to solve a problem they have not yet really correctly identified. And for that reason, a lot of thoughts are expressed that are not as solidly based in the law as really might be nice. Yeah, I, but my thinking on it is that they have evidence that I have a Social Security number, and therefore they would also have jurisdiction over me besides over the, the vehicle itself. You know, they would have, whether or not that vehicle was registered or not, they'd still have jurisdiction over me. The, so social, the social security insurance agreement does have a political affiliation called a citizenship character to it. That's right. true. That won't matter in a state court. Social Security is administered on a state level. That's true. Right. The existence of the social would matter for a federal court scenario. The existence of the state citizenship typically generated through the driver's license would be the controlling mechanism in the state courts. There is a tie for tracking purposes because everything is going to go toward the national ID rather than the state ID, and all of that's going to move toward the political association with the New World Order by whatever name they use, whether it's United Nations or something different. So they're, they're making an accounting connection between the Social Security and the state citizenship, which would be the driver's license, typically, not the sole thing. But where where you're coming with your questions, which are excellent, and I say they're excellent because there's a lot of people that have this same sort of connection in their mind about how that system works. It's a tangled web of information that's out there. And one of the reasons that Michael has me on the program is so that we can untangle that web. Right. And right. so the, the connection between Social Security and the driver's license obviously exists. Is that a basis for the jurisdiction? Of the municipal court, no. There, there are other mechanisms by which the municipal court does justify its jurisdiction. But we, have about, we have about 30 seconds left. Uh, Mike, you're welcome to uh, stay through the commercial and ask another question, but why don't you go okay. ahead and, and pose one now so we can think about it. Yeah. What, isn't the state actually a federal state, though? So Why don't you... Why don't you hold the answer to that? We'll, we'll, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that as a teaser. Um, and uh, that, I think that's an excellent question. Thank you for calling, Mike. These are great questions. Um, and, Harmon, thank you for your excellent answers. This is uh, Michael Badnarik. We are here on We the People Radio Network. We are talking with uh, Harmon Taylor and Mike in Illinois about trust law, trying to untangle 
this web of in- misinformation. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Uh, Mike, you had a, a question. You want to repeat your question that we went to just before the break? Yes. Uh, just that uh, aren't the states considered federal states? And let's uh, let's address that starting with this. You know, I hear in the question a presumption that a state would have jurisdiction over someone or something solely because it exists. If we were dealing with a law of the land based system, I would agree with that. We are not. And I want to illustrate what we are dealing with because the answer to your question is in the question itself. Let's focus on the term federal. The question is, what does federal mean? And these are steps that come back to answer your question, which are, let me just do that right now. Are the states federal? Yes. Now, let's understand what federal means. Federal means federal. Federal does not mean national. Federal does absolutely not mean constitutional. Federal means federal. What does that mean? At the level of a state, federal means by compact or by treaty. So if we get in mind a picture of a body politic that's recognized by a certain name, Indiana, Illinois, and we re- we recognize that group as such, then their ministers plenipotentiary, their representatives to another body politic, have the authority to enter into a compact or a treaty between those bodies politic. That would be a federal agreement. Okay, at the level of the individual, that's the body politic level. That's where most of our education focuses us. Where we need to go is to the individual level. What does federal mean at the individual level? Federal means by private obligation. Now, let's put some pieces together. Are the states federal? Yes. Therefore, what is their mechanism for authority for anything? Private obligation. They don't have authority without it. Right. This is this is the the I think I'm finding in my experience this is the the kind of barrier that we run into, and it's a tough one. And it's why your questions are so good. I repeat, Michael's characterization of the questions are excellent, and we need to discuss these things. And in this scenario, it's perfect because why? Because a state like this thing called the federal government, this thing called the state government operates by exact same principles. What are those principles? Private obligation. The two generic types, contracts and trusts. Is a state federal? Yes. Now, you've just answered the question to your jurisdiction issue. Yeah. If there's an agreement, then there is the authority to enforce it. No agreement, no authority to enforce it. Right. Well, just like they've divided the title to property... Good. There was a case, I read a case years ago, and I can't find it anymore, that said that the human, the, the, the person, the individual is a body, mind, and spirit. And in the case, they divided it up and basically said that they've made us just a body, and we're, we're, we're before the court just as a body. Well, again, the, and I appreciate the question. The question presumes a scenario that authority exists just because. And it's a tough one, but I'm going to come back to you and tell you whether they divide it into three pieces or 13 pieces or 33 pieces. If there isn't an agreement there, then the matter is over before it starts. And for there to be an agreement there, I will tell you that there must also be a sentient mind recognized under the authority of the law of that system to have the capacity, right, and authority to enter into agreements. If we don't have that, then the only characteristic of that human being is a slave. A slave does not have the capacity to enter into agreements. And this 
entirety of the system that we have right now would collapse immediately. Why? Because it's a federal system. It exists by agreement. Right. Okay, so we can we can focus on body and we can focus on federal and we can focus on a lot of these things, and they are very, very helpful steps in the process, to be sure. If we stop there and if we do not go into the agreement at issue, then we are missing the foundational issue. Right, right. No, I... No, I understand it's the, it's the original agreement. This, the point is, I guess, is trying to understand what, you know, we're stuck in this position and what is that position they put us in. But, you know, you're right, you're getting to the foundation. It's the original agreement. I, right. I guess I'm thinking about how the, I heard the Attorneys Act of 1938 says attorneys can only represent artificial entities and property. So we must be one of those two when we're before the court with an attorney. Is that does that make sense? Or well, uh, here again, we're we're trying to identify jurisdiction without looking at the agreement. If all we are is property, or if all we are is an entity, then where is the authority to enter into the agreement? So it's a, basically a catch-22 situation. If we are only property, then there is no agreement. And if we are competent to enter into the agreement, then there has to be consciousness. And, and if they don't let us know that the agreement exists, then it's fraud. Do I understand that correctly? Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say fraud. Up until that point, you were 100% correct. <laughs> oh, we, we, can't, it. we can't go instantly to fraud. What we can do is say, if they're asserting authority over us, any human being, then there must be the agreement. And here's, here's the only change I'm going to make in what you said. If we, have the, if we don't have the agreement, they don't have the authority. Right. Jump, Harmon, jumping to conclusions is probably the only exercise I get. <laughs> From Illinois, you are back on the line if you have any more questions. And again, other people can call in. You don't have to uh, let us monopolize it. 5264619984 or 888202-1984. Get involved. Call the program. Okay. Yeah, I just have one, one quick question for Harmon, and I appreciate all the help he's been. Uh, I have appreciate a, your call. Uh, yeah, I have excellent a, questions. Yeah, I have a six-year-old that a six and a four-year-old. They don't have birth certificates, or social security numbers, and I'm, I myself am working on you know eliminating these contracts. Can, is it possible for me to give him some land and he and he hold it in a lodial title? Absolutely. It is. Amen. Um, I love they, that answer. The at, at their age of minority, uh, I mean, this fits in the program, too. You'll probably want to transfer it in trust, mm -hmm. uh, transferable that to them then at some point after the, uh, after the age of majority. And in general, I'm not kidding at all. Some people think this is hilarious. I would not make a distribution of a trust uh, res, the actual principle of the trust, to anybody under the age of 40, and uh, it just life is different by then for a lot of reasons. The, the generic thought about property is we've got to understand, this goes back to the Calvary City of New London case, we've got to understand how that property exists up under the authority of the federal system, and since it's federal, we know that the property got there by some kind of private obligation or other. So the generic answer to your question is, yes, absolutely, you can transfer land to them. And it's not that you can't put it in their name at, at whatever age you want to. It's, it's that they're really not in a position to own it yet. So you can either wait till they get to be age of majority or put it in trust. But... The thing isn't that quite so much as it is understanding all of the gotchas that go into land ownership. Right. So we've got, again, we've got the capacity issue. 
We've got time, place, choice of law, medium of exchange, property description, and matters of this nature to know affirmatively how to document in writing so as to make that transaction one that doesn't bring that property up under the authority of the federal system. Can I take a minute here to uh, rewind? Um, Mike, you indicated that you have uh, two children that do not have birth certificates and do not have Social Security numbers. Right. Um, can, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? I'm, I'm thinking that some of our listeners are in shock, thinking that it's not possible. You can't get out of the hospital without a uh, birth certificate. Can you, can you give us your personal experience on how that was uh, possible? Well, they were both born at home. I had a midwife. And Excellent. So we didn't have to deal with that at all. <laughs> and and, and uh, so your children do not exist because they don't have birth certificates. Well, so <laughs> if, if, I came, if I came to your house, they would just be invisible because there's no <laughs> legal documentation for their, for their existence? Actually, uh, I, I can't remember if we've actually done this yet or not, but it's my understanding that you enter in enter their names into the front of your family Bible, and that's a legal document that can be used in court. Uh, just fixing to mention, if you'll get each of them a Bible and document that information, you'll be glad you did, and get maybe in, in addition to the big ornate kind, mm -hmm. a small pocket size that has the exact same information in it. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll, we, we may have to do a whole other show on that, but that's a very good idea and good for you for mentioning it. Okay. Yeah. And I'm and I am I'm proud of you and your wife for uh, taking that action. So I know that it sounds a little bit uh, outrageous to some of our listeners that you know your your children wouldn't have a birth certificate. And in fact, that some of our listeners may go so far to think that you were an unfit parent. Um, I would like to. <laughs> I would like to preempt those ideas by suggesting that you are indeed doing everything that you possibly can to protect your children. I uh, I respect you very greatly for that. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we 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 also homeschool so that we you know uh, not into that contract either with the, with the state. So. Uh, well, in the future, give me a call. I'll uh, be happy to come out to uh, Illinois and uh, do a little bit of uh, homeschooling on your children about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Okay, great. Okay, I'll, I'll let you go out. Harmon, appreciate all, all your work, and uh, I'll hang up and listen. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate okay. that. That's Michael from Illinois who has uh, helped uh, control the discussion. You're welcome to uh, call in your questions, 512-646-1984. Um, Harmon Taylor is a former bar certified attorney, and he has uh, dissolved that association, and he is here helping us to understand the true nature of our connection with the law and uh, and sometimes it is uh, disturbing discovering that the Supreme Court is doing stuff in my favor I am still just a, a shock and a gape here so um, we are talking about uh, trust law uh, again, we've got uh, another 10 minutes after this uh, upcoming commercial. You are uh, more than encouraged to exercise your freedom of speech. Um, and, uh, Harmon, we've got about uh, 30 seconds before the commercial. Any uh, comments, words of wisdom? Let me just throw in some Francophile random facts in this time period. Random fact. The first S11 website was French. The first S11 documentary was French, and I will tell you it's not accidental that that French film crew happened to have a camera that could zoom from street level to the building to catch the first plane. They had to have known where to be. And we have a series of people on the line. Um, please keep your questions uh, succinct and to the point so that we can get everybody online as we play the lightning round here on Trust Law. Brian in Pennsylvania. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I'll do my best to be concise. I have a pretty big question, though. I've um, been doing a lot of uh, research on the law, and I'm wondering um, if there are specific 
Uh, well, for my question, if there's a specific realm of law that I should be investigating more, I'm, I'm looking into um, how we could prosecute um, prosecute some of the perpetrators, uh, whether it be for the September 11th attack and some sinister elements of that, or just the gross negligence that we see across the board in, in government to the try problem, to rid ourselves of such a problem. The problem we have on criminal prosecution is that the people we need to prosecute literally commercially own the prosecution system. Let me gear you toward a case that's just the beginning of the concept, Bivens, v six federal narcotics agents. What we have in the Bivens... Yeah, is it B-I-Z-O-N-S? B, uh, Bravo, Indigo, Victor, Echo, November, Sierra. Okay. And what the Supremes did there was establish a commercial claim for violation of clearly established rights. The guy was kidnapped in his own home, uh, hauled off, and put in jail. It was it was a bad drug bust, <clears throat> and so he sued. As, a, as opposed to a good drug bust. Right. Uh, this guy was totally criminally victimized. So, yeah, with the crime as the basis for the commercial claim, the individual has some... Reven revenue, revenue, remedy in the commercial system and the judicial system. The criminal stuff at that level, don't hold your breath. Right. As I know we're not living in a world where it's likely to see some of the uh, some of the negligent ones be hung from the gallows. Lord knows, I'd be I'd be happy to build a frame for those. But um, Brian, Brian, thank, thank I have you, another piece I know you got other callers. Yeah, I have a piece of trivial information for you. I used to be a Boy Scout for 12 years, Scoutmaster for 10 years. I know how to tie 32 knots, and one of them is a hangman's noose. If that information ever comes in handy, please don't hesitate to call me. Will do. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Good Brian. Day. We're going to go immediately to Bill in Indiana. Bill? Hello, Mike. Hey, I have the CD from We the Prosperity. I haven't got to go through it yet, but I will. But, Bless your uh, heart. Yeah, thank you. Oh. And you you handwrite all over every one of them too. I think it's pretty cool. Um, but I I didn't get to hear the whole part of the program. But you were talking about uh, you know the, the what the is last... the matter with you, Bill? You need hey, to you get know I am, I am, I'm earning a living and cheating while I listen. Okay. <laughs> so, but but anyway, I'm going to still savor every word. Trust me. I, I'm, I'm I download every one of them. Every word's gone through my head. It's been processed. But um, going back to our caller, Mike from Illinois. With yeah. the uh, children who's homeschooled and such, um, yeah. I homeschooled. But also the uh, my understanding is that I know he's saying he doesn't have birth certificates, but there are different people who actually go and create uh, certificates of live birth, where they t get the uh, uh, the doctor or the nurse or the midwife or a witness or grandpa, and they get a couple names of the people who say yes, I was there. This is Joey, you know not in those kid who was born on this date so that there's some type of a proof instead of saying, oh, I'm not, I don't exist. And the second thing I thought is real interesting, and I don't know if it got covered, but when a marriage gets a, a license in the state, there's the, the, the children are the byproduct of that marriage and belong to the state. And uh, to quote George Gordon, which I don't always do, but he's saying that uh, Social lady can't take children away that don't have a social security number because they don't belong to the state. Just like when you have a palimony, they don't go through divorce court with a common law marriage. They have to go through a regular court where the rules are a whole lot more fair. Could you comment on that? Well, that's a, this is something that Ray Kapitka mentioned on Tuesday. Uh, Ray Kapitka is one of the women in Oregon mm -hmm. who um, dropped a bombshell on the uh, county commissioners there. And in her introduction, she pointed out that her long career in uh, associated with law, um, that the marriage license, she discovered that a marriage license gives the uh, state a uh, ownership of the parents and the children, which is something that you know, was glossed over, but yes, this is this is a concept that is coming to to light more and more, and uh, it is a concept that I have in my book, Good to Be King, available at ConstitutionPreservation.org, which everybody should own. Thank you, thank Thanks you. To their Bible. 
Yes. Well, I don't know that it needs to be that high on your list of reading material, but uh, I do appreciate, uh, and and we are trying to light the fires of liberty. So, um, yeah, the, once people understand how these uh, legal connections are made, um, perhaps they will be less enthusiastic about getting a marriage license. Uh, very briefly, I point out that any time the government gives you permission, they let you know that you have permission by giving you a license or a permit, such as a driver's license, a concealed carry permit. And then rhetorical questions, if you have a marriage license, what do you have permission to do now that you did not have permission to do before? Who gave you that permission, and where did they get the authority to give you permission in the first place? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, Please. Bill, I want to thank you for uh, being a regular caller here. Common law, if I understand it correctly, is based on property. Um, and the, the there are two bases for uh, common law. One is, you know, um, basically don't damage your neighbor's property. Okay. And, and the second part is, you know, always, you know, keep your word. If you engage in a contract, ensure that you follow through with the, that contract. Um, and because... It was common sense. Um, it wasn't typically written down. And um, these two bases for uh, within common law are the, um, the origin of civil law, or excuse me, criminal law and civil law, respectively. So if you damage somebody's property, you actually cause harm that would fall under criminal law. And... You know, if you, somebody has hired you to paint the house, they've given you the money, and then you, you know, basically don't follow through on your end of the bargain, didn't keep your word. That's the basis of civil law. Is that kind of a good starting point? It's a good starting point, sure. So we, uh, a bunch of people eventually left Europe. They came to North America, and, um, you know, after severing ties with the king, the, the Constitution in essence, is supposed to establish or ground our form of government in common law. In Article 6 of the Constitution, it says, uh, this law and all the treaties pursuant to it um, shall be the supreme law of the land. Now, do I understand correctly that law of the land is the equivalent of common law? It is the basis for it, yes. So, of course, the, the basis for the common law is scripture. So it it dates back uh, at least that far. But yeah, law of the land and common law go hand in hand. Now, I, I say that common law was for for many, you know, generations and centuries not even written down because it tends to be fairly common sense. Um, when I teach my Constitution classes, I point out that, you know, if you happen to turn around and witness someone being shot, you know, uh, you know, somebody pulls out a gun and, and shoots someone else, it's not required to whip out your little copy of the Constitution and go, God, I, I think that's against the law. I'm going to have to look that up. You know, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to look it up. You know just instinctively that that would be not nice, and that it is probably in violation of some law. It, so, certain, it certainly compels an investigation. It, it certainly would compel an investigation. That, that's true. So, so we have um, a Constitution and a Bill of Rights and all of these uh, documents which um, purport to activate or... Um, animate the uh, the idea and the spirit of of common law now we talk about common law and the constitution as the supreme law of the land and yesterday we were talking about land and not land which right. at, at, at first that sounded uh, a little bit strange and bizarre, but once we got into it, it, it made perfectly good sense. Um, now, the choice of law question. That's the first place. Are we dealing with the land or not? 
And, and I, again, I have been studying the Constitution for quite some time, been teaching my Constitution classes, and so I have, I'm very pleased with myself that I have gotten it so correct, you know, just kind of on my own, 85, 95% correct, maybe a few pieces missing. But, um, one of the things that I ex- emphasize in my classes is the fact that there are different types of law. You know, law doesn't just fall into one huge bucket. You know, there are, there are different categories and different types of law, and that you can't win a game, you can't even successfully survive a game unless you know which body of law you're in, involved in. Sure. And it helps so, to know the rules to the game. It helps to know the rules to the game. Um, and in preface to all of this, I sometimes ask my students, you know, uh, it's been very fun and very polite up until that time, and I said, you know, by, and raise your hand if you'd like to play a game with me. And, uh, you know, I, I usually control them and, and get, you know, 80% of the students at least to um, raise their hands. They they already know me. I've already pulled a couple of fast ones on them in class, and so some of them are are suspicious, hesitant to uh, play a game with this uh, smiling guy at the front of the classroom. But uh, after, you know, a significant number of people raise their hands, my response to them is, I win, you lose. And they're stunned. And I tell them that the, the rules of the game, the rules of the game are, I win, you lose. And, and then I ask them, how many want to play the game again? And very few people, nobody raises their hand. I mean, now now that they know, know the rules, I mean, you'd have to have a lobotomy to uh, want to engage in, in that kind of activity. Um, you know, unless you're just you know, really masochistic. So the um, the idea is that when you go into a court of law, um, you can't prevail, you can't defend yourself um, in that court of law, if you have no idea what branch of law um, you're engaged in, and that's that's part of the problem. Most most people do not understand um, the the type of law that they are uh, participating in. And when we get done explaining it in my class, I, I let them know that the "I win, you lose" rules, by comparison, are fairly friendly. Um, Article three of the Constitution um, establishes three different jurisdictions, common law, um, equity law, and admiralty law. And and we've got about a minute. We've already talked a little bit about common law. Can you give us about 60 seconds on equity law? Because we're not going to talk about that long. Equity comes from the church court side of the British system. There were the king's courts and the ecclesiastical courts. And when the king's courts were producing results that basically, let's just say they shocked the conscience. They just seemed so outrageous that they just couldn't be the law. What happened was people were going over to the church courts and getting relief. We talk about relief uh, at law, which is basically a money issue. And then there's injunctive relief, mandamus relief, these sorts of things on the equity side. So equity is the, the progeny of the church courts way back when. And, and so you, you could basically you know, pick and choose to some extent uh, whether you're going to be ruled by the king or ruled by the church. And um, our Constitution reflects uh, and acknowledges those two uh, origins. In a sense, yeah, the ecclesiastical courts are open right after the king's court's remedies have been exhausted. What's civil or Roman law? The Roman system uh, was, well, if we understood it in today's terms, Rome was the first great experiment in the maritime law-based society. Basically, law comes out of the Senate. Well, they had a constitution. So law comes out of the constitution. Law comes out of the Senate. Of course, all that got taken over, and they had dictators called Caesars. And that was the the form of their law. But they, they were not 
governed by the uh, what we'd call common law today. They weren't governed by scripture. Mm-hmm. They were governed by your your mind, body, and soul are subject to the authority of the dictator. 